First of all, let's pray together. Father, this morning, uh, we just come to tell you we love you. Actually, we come to church today, all your kids, and some of us really love you, and some of us are here because, uh, I don't know, it's family expects us to be here. Some of us probably came because it's uh, kind of an old habit that we've always done, and some of us, uh, we can't think of any better thing to do on Sunday morning. It won't hurt us. And so, Father, regardless of where we come from today, it's our prayer that we would fall in love with you and we would really enjoy being with you. That was your desire for us, and I would pray that would be our desire for you. Now, as we take a look at this gift you gave us, your book, I would pray that we would uh, read it, we would understand it, but mainly we would be obedient to it. So bless us today as we attempt to do that. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You've all figured out by now that, uh, to put it mildly, 2023 was not a good year for the Kansas City Royals. Uh, in fact, they not only didn't come in first, uh, they barely came in. And uh, certainly in sports and actually in a lot of areas of our life, I would think most of us would have to say, uh, boy, see, being number one just seems to be so important. But it's more than important, it almost becomes vital. We treat it like it's the only thing that counts. And many of us here would tend to agree with that. That's a go for it attitude. We're all for that. So if that's the case, then what do we do with the book of Mark? That gospel whose author seems to base his whole book on chapter 10, verse 43, when he quotes Jesus Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life a ransom for many. That could just cause a little problem for some of us. What kind of a person would actually write something like that? Who was this Mark anyway? Before we get into what he actually wrote, let's uh, take a look at who he was and where did he come from. It seems like most of the other New Testament authors were well-known somebodies, like Matthew and Luke and John and James. They were all apostles. And, of course, there was Paul, the great evangelist. So who was this Mark, and what were the situations and influences in his life that may have called him to write one of the Gospels? And you and I, we all have first names and, of course, last names, and so it was true for him. His first name was John, and his Hebrew name and surname or Latin last name was Mark, obviously using his surname most frequently. His name in Scripture is never mentioned in the book of Mark, but it comes to us in First in Acts 12. Nothing is known about his father, but his mother was Mary, who was apparently a somewhat prominent resident of Jerusalem and owned a house large enough to accommodate many Christians gathered for prayer. I would suspect that she was doing a small group in her house on a regular basis. Just a little humorous side that might get a little close to home as we think about our own lives on this situation in Acts 12. Uh, as we re read that, uh, Peter had just been released from prison and by Herod. And we read, when this had dawned on him, on Peter, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, 
He ran back without even opening it and exclaimed, Peter's at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking. And when they opened the door, they saw him. And they were astounded. Have you ever prayed for something for quite a while? And then when it happened, you stood there and go, now what do I do with this? God answered it. So we see that Mark's early life as Mary's son was involved with many other Christians who frequented his mother's home for prayer. He got to hang with the big dogs. We read in Colossians 4 verse 10 that Mark was the cousin of Barnabas, who was a Levite from Cyprus and well-known church leader. In Acts 13, we find Barnabas and Saul in Antioch with many of the prophets and the teachers. It was there that these leaders laid their hands on them and sent them out on what we know as the missionary journeys. And that one was the first one. We find Mark beginning his ministry when he went with Saul and Barnabas. In verse 5, it says, And John was with them as their helper. But when they got to Perga in Pamphylia, John suddenly left them and returned to Jerusalem, much to Paul's dismay. We aren't told the reasons he left yet. There's many speculations that have come up. One was that since they had laid hands on Paul and Barnabas and not on him, he probably didn't feel called. Now perhaps he found out that the work of being a traveling missionary turned out to be harder than he expected. Others detected a growing dislike for Paul since the leadership influence of his cousin Barnabas seemed to be declining. There was a little bit of jealousy in there maybe. A bit later, we read in Acts 15, when Paul and Barnabas planned their second missionary journey, Barnabas wanted to ask Mark to come along. But Paul was not at all interested. We read that Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with him, but Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. I guess we could kind of sit back and justify, and I would think, you know, it wasn't such a bad idea. You know, really, now we got two missionary teams going out instead of just one, so we just doubled the efforts. So there's a little glitch in the works, but we now have two missionary teams. We've gotten really better instructions than that on how to do mission work. We're finding Romans 12, 18, live at peace with everyone as far as it depends on you. And again in Hebrews 10, 24, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Their spurring kind of went to gouging, and it caused problems. After that sharp separation, we don't find anything written in Scripture regarding Mark for a long time. But good news, God was still quite capable of healing relationships in Mark's day as well as today. Over those 10 years, we see evidence of growing for both Paul and Mark. During Paul's imprisonment in Rome, we read in Colossians 4, my fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. And in Philemon 24, we read, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings, as so does Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. And later, when Paul was in prison in Rome for the second time, awaiting his martyrdom, he asked young Timothy, take Mark and bring him with you, for he is profitable to me for ministry. What a godly compliment of seeing that relationship. Do this again. How many different people and situations does God put together to bring healings and ministry and living testimonies 
of his faithfulness. As much as Mark's name and popularity in reference to this gospel is present in scripture, it seems that much of what that came by indirect means. He was not named as one of Jesus' apostles. He was probably a teenager during Jesus' ministry years, and it isn't recorded regarding any personal contacts with Jesus. However, except for one, there may have been one painfully close contact at the time of Jesus' arrest in the garden, as we see in chapter 14. Then everyone deserted Jesus and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garments behind. Since this was only record, recorded in, in Mark, this may have been a reference, an anonymous reference. And he's the only one that knew that particular situation and wrote about it. It's just a bit ironic that Mark even mentioned one of his more embarrassing moments, quite possibly learned from someone who is also personally knew some bad moments. Peter. As mentioned earlier, Mark would later desert Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, and certainly Peter had firsthand experience in denying his Lord, as well as other regrettable situations. Obviously, John Mark's restoration for useful, useful ministry was certainly influenced by Peter, and his presence in Mark's life helped him to grow into maturity for the work God would later call him. For those of you that have ever made a mistake in your life, be encouraged. There may be somebody else watching you real close that can learn something. As I had mentioned earlier, we first read of Mark in Acts 12, as Peter had just been released from prison and immediately went to a prayer meeting at Mark's mother's house. Apparently, Peter and the other apostles were frequent visitors in that home, so growing up, Mark was well exposed to the personal teachings of the apostles. He may have been a convert to Christianity due to the influence of Peter, as the apostle refers to Mark as his son in the faith in 1 Peter 5. Many early church fathers agree that Mark wrote this book, and they may have even retitled it Peter's Gospel. Since the Jerusalem church met at Mark's house, and since Mark had worked with Peter in Rome, it was natural that Peter was one of the major sources of the contents of the Gospel of Mark. This book was written sometime between 50 and 70 AD, giving it a date before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD was based on Jesus' comment in Mark 13, where he says, Do you see all these great buildings? Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. One of the church fathers, Irenaeus, stated that Mark wrote the gospel after the death of Peter. Since Peter died in the persecution of the emperor Nero, which lasted from about 63 to 64, the earliest would probably be 64 AD. Even though we're in the New Testament in terms of our current teaching series, we never really leave the Old Testament. At least I don't. God's plan way back in Genesis 12 through the Abrahamic covenant was to bless his people so that they might be a blessing, so that all the world might be blessed and through him know his name. We see this evident here in the four Gospels, specifically in terms of their audiences, as we find the four Gospels being very diverse. As Carrie uh, told us again last week, Matthew was written to a Jewish audience where kingship was key. Luke addressed the Greeks, as we've been hearing Pastor J.D., emphasizing Jesus as the Son of Man. John keys in on the Christians in the church and presents Christ as the Son of God. Here in Mark, we find him zeroing in on the Gentile believers in Rome, emphasizing the servanthood of Jesus. His congregation was certainly not Jewish and therefore did not speak Aramaic as Jesus and Mark did, so we find him translating some of the Aramaic terms, such as mentioning Simon to mean Peter. And when Jesus healed Jairus' daughter, he called to her Talitha Kuman. Mark translated that for them as to mean little girl. 
The Gospel of Mark includes far fewer references to the Old Testament than the other Gospels. And Mark even makes reference to Rufus, the son of Simon of Cyrene, who was a primate, prominent member of the Roman Church. Mark obviously does not include any of Jesus' genealogy at the beginning of his writing. This would only be of interest to Jewish readers, who was important and had to have introductions in genealogy. And he was writing to Gentiles. His writing style is one of action, which may have been a reflection of his mentor, Peter. It seems like his operative word immediately and straightway was so important to him. We find him using it 42 times in his gospel. Every once in a while, just for fun, and just for fun, I'll sit down and read one book of the Bible. Not to study it, but just to sit down and read it all the way through. Uh, a number of months ago, I, was, I picked up Mark and was reading that, and I got tired just reading it. Uh, by the time I got to the end, I was almost out of breath. That was Mark's style. It's a book of action, which certainly fit into the Roman way of thinking, that of movement and power. As is true of all writers of Scripture, we know that it was the Holy Spirit who gave the ideas and words to the human authors. We also know that in the middle of that, God used a variety of men throughout history, all with different backgrounds and personalities and life experiences. And such was true of Mark. He also was used by God to write and was influenced by many different people in life situations. As stated earlier, according to Acts 12, he grew up in that home where there was so much activity involving the mother who opened up her home for regular prayer meetings. He later traveled with Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary trip, even though he opted out early. And despite that interruption, he and Paul apparently grew to appreciate each other, and he was later involved with Paul during his imprisonments in Rome. However, it's very obvious that Peter was a primary influence in Mark's life. Early tradition stated that Mark was the interpreter of Peter, writing down the words and deeds of Lord Jesus Christ as Peter related them. We seem to believe that as Mark accompanied Peter, he wrote down Peter's messages. Peter the fisherman may not have spoken fluent Greek, so perhaps that may be a reason that Mark interpreted for him. Just a little note uh, interjected here regarding the very end of Mark's gospel, chapter 16, verse 9 through 20. This is somewhat of a disputed section since it's missing from some early Greek manuscripts. Note that this seems to be a textual problem rather than one of inspiration. The essential contents of those verses are found in other parts of Scripture. So you don't need to wonder and be nervous, is that included in Scripture? Indeed, it is. If you have any questions regarding this, you can refer to a sermon by our one and only uh, pastor who preached on Revelation back in uh, December 4, in 2016. You can get that online uh, if you want to see some details. He addresses that. So now, what does this gospel actually say? In a word, Mark's gospel presents Jesus as a servant. Perhaps it's best stated in 1045, <coughs> excuse me, when he says, for even the Son of Man came not to minister, be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Then he breaks the chapter, 16 chapters down into six sections. The presentation of the servant, the authority of the servant, the opposition to the servant, the instructions by the servant, the rejection of the servant, and finally, the resurrection of the servant. The ministry of Jesus began with crowds in Galilee, and it moves on to concentrating on the 12 apostles and finally ends in Judea and Jerusalem, alone on the cross. In the Gentile and especially the Roman world, action, speed, and busyness were the norm. 
Some big event was on the horizon. It was announced boldly in advance. The king were traveling somewhere, and an envoy would travel ahead of him, making sure the roads were safe for travel, as well as heralding his coming. Since Mark was beginning to intentionally write about the most important person who ever lived, it was very appropriate to have someone introduce his coming. Enter John the Baptist, who announces the coming of the Messiah. In fact, the original announcer of the announcer of Jesus is done way back almost 800, mile, 800 years earlier by the prophet Isaiah. Mark 1 and 2 reads, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so it happened. John the Baptist appeared to all the country of Judea and Jerusalem, baptizing those in the Jordan River who confessed their sins. His preaching was very deliberate. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize with water, but he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. The irony of this huge heralding by Isaiah and John the Baptist was that Mark intentionally neglects any genealogy of this important figure to this Gentile audience. This is what had been a large part of the introduction of anyone of importance. During that era, the 33 AD edition of that book, Who's Who in Jerusalem, would have not sold out real quickly. Mark was not about pomp, popularity, or power. He was there to introduce the gospel to the Gentiles, as evidenced by the suffering servant. First through the healing miracles, and eventually through his personal death and resurrection. He begins in chapter 1, first verse. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in the New Testament, the word gospel is never a reference simply to a book. Rather, it refers to the message of salvation. This first century audience would have understood the word gospel to mean good news or glad tidings. That word evangelion was understood by these early Romans to be associated with good tidings of a coming king. In their case, they thought of Caesar, not of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. That's part of the reason Mark wrote this book. Surprisingly, in the middle of John the Baptist preaching and baptizing, we find Jesus coming from Nazareth to be baptized by John. You think that's strange? Even John did, but he responded to Jesus anyway. Why? Jesus explained in Matthew 3.15, Let it be so. It is perfect for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Both Jesus and John knew that this baptism was not for Jesus' sin, since he was sinless, but rather to completely fulfill the righteousness of his Father's will. Again, the servanthood of Jesus becomes obvious. The second reason for Jesus' baptism was not even so much for baptism, but rather what happened immediately at the end of his baptism. As part of Mark's hurried-up style recording the life of Jesus, he doesn't even write much about the actual baptism. Instead, he tells of what happened immediately at the end of the baptism. Mark 1.10 reads, As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw the heaven being torn open, and the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love, with whom I am pleased. Jesus was baptized not only to fulfill all righteousness, he also did it to have his ministry authenticated publicly by his father. With the full endorsement of his father, this Jesus was free to demonstrate his divine authority, even in his role as a servant. Shortly after his father had spoken, <coughs> excuse me, we read in verse 12, Chapter 1, at once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert 40 days being tempted by Satan. In Mark's rush to 
give only highlights of the gospel. He simply says that the angels attended him. In Matthew 4, we hear more details as, Ma as Jesus responds to Satan three times. It is written. It is written. It is written. Satan, get behind me. With Mark's abruptness and frequent jumping from one event to another, we may start to think that even Jesus was on a time clock. Not necessarily so. Many times in Scripture we read references to the word time, but they have very little in common with our clock or calendar time. For example, we read in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, and at just the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Or in Romans 5, 8, and at just the right time Christ, while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Or Esther's question to Mordecai in chapter 4 of Esther. And who knows but that you have come to the royal position for such a time as this. Here it's different. After Jesus' temptation, he was still in the wilderness preaching. And John was still baptizing in the Jordan River. That's where we read in Mark 1.14. Now after John had been taken into custody... Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Yes, now the time was right for Jesus to begin his earthly ministry for real. Mark is certainly eager to record it for us. The next three years is filled with Jesus calling his apostles, teaching among the crowds, performing miracles, and teaching at the local synagogues. Chapter 121 reads, They went in Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and began to teach. They were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Already knowing his future and his ultimate purpose, Jesus began the process of selecting and calling those who would be used to continue the spread of the gospel. Chapter 116. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the sons of thunder, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called to them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. These were not mere invites to a couple of ragtag fishermen that Jesus just happened to stumble on while he was strolling around the lake. These were intentional selections and commands made by someone on a mission of getting the gospel to the whole world. And we find Jesus continuing that selection process with eight other men until he had gathered his 12 apostles. His purpose was to use his next three years in doing miracles and teaching the multitudes, but also to use this intimate time with 12 apostles who could follow, watch closely, and learn how to model the methods and intentions of their master. Just as he, we had seen in the Old Testament in Exodus 25, we read that God instructed Moses to build a sanctuary for him, that I may dwell with him, with them. The same desire is true of Jesus as he called his, his apostles. In Mark 3, 14, we read, he appointed 12 apostles, the designating them that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. Intimacy between the Father and his people, as well as Jesus and his called out ones, was and still is extremely important. During this time, we find Jesus healing Simon's mother-in-law, that same day, they encountered many other sick and demon-possessed whom Jesus healed. More public preaching than healing obviously drew greater crowds, even though Jesus had instructed those he had healed to tell no one. Back in the day, which was for me was probably in the 70s, 
uh, Don Francisco came out with a song about uh, Jesus healing Jairus' daughter. Don Francisco saying, got to tell somebody, got to tell somebody, got to tell somebody what Jesus did for me. And Jesus says, no, be quiet about that. Even in the middle of all his, this godly and necessary ministry, Jesus took time to step aside and pray. Again, we find the Son of God humbly seeking input from his Father as a true servant. After his time with his father, his apostles came and found him and almost breathlessly reminded him, everybody's looking for you. Again, Jesus resumes his teaching and healing, not just to get her done, but as in Mark 2, 4, we find Jesus filled with compassion, reached out his hand and touched the man. We can just see Jesus' tender eyes gently reaching out and touching with miraculous results all the marks of a true servant. Of course, there was a crowd. Just think how this scene must have compared to Medicare with all its supplemental plans, all done with a servant's heart. But sadly enough, those lame and blind and demon-possessed and lepers were not the only ones in the crowd who noticed him. If a primary election would have been held at that time, this future messianic king would not have won by a landslide. There were many in the pharisaical mindset who watched intensely from a distance, and even some of them up close. They also took note of what Jesus did and the way that he did it and the results that were evident but they watched exclusively from doubting, questioning, and critical eyes. Their observation only brought on extremely cynical questions and accusations, which at best only exposed their defiled hearts. Perhaps they could have even tolerated some of the healings in the name of humanitarian dignity, but they drew the line when Jesus made any references to his divinity. They could handle the paralytic being lowered through the roof. But that Jesus had, son, had said, son, your sins are forgiven. That crossed the line of blasphemy for them. Not only was criticism coming from the angry Pharisees, it was also coming from a more low-keyed crowd, but consistent hometown group. They seemed a bit kinder in that they primarily asked questions as opposed to making vehement statements. However, in Mark 6, 1, we read, Jesus left there and went to his hometown of Nazareth, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? What's the wisdom that has been given him? He even does miracles. Isn't he the carpenter? And they took offense at him. Yes, Jesus' first week of life as an unwanted baby in a manger was difficult, but actually quite sweet and memorable and non-threatening to the world. Then the beginning of his three years of public ministry started quite well. He selected his apostles, and they seemed to be kind of faithful, interested, at times, he traveled around Galilee teaching and making many sick people grateful, and he even had to hold back the crowds due his, to his popularity. All this time, Jesus traveled many miles, teaching, performing miracles, the obvious external things, as well as waiting for his internal, more quiet, but intense purpose with his apostles. Unfortunately, even they did not really understand who he was, much less what his ultimate purpose was. A breakthrough began to happen as we read in chapter 8, verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi was a kind of out-of-the-place Gentile town 25 miles up the road, way in the northeast. That's like from here to Ottawa. And Jesus takes him out for a walk one day. 
And on that way, he asked him, so who do people say that I am? Oh, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. That was the safe, general, public question. Now Jesus gets to the real question. But what about you? Who do you say that I am? Peter, Mark's good friend, answered, you are the Christ. Eventually and finally, that will be the one question we will each be asked that will determine our eternal destination. After Peter's statement, Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. That was major in the message that Mark is presenting. The Jews could not really accept the fact of Jesus being the Messiah. Their vision of Messiah was someone who would come to defeat the Romans and allow the Jews to be in control politically. Even the apostles had some questions about that and struggled with why Jesus was playing the role of a servant rather than make a power play to demonstrate strength and defeat the Romans. That's why we find Jesus' messianic mission simply cannot be understood anywhere apart from the cross. Chapter 8, 34, we read, And he summoned the crowd with the disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. That fundamental sermon of Christ is repeated in all three of the synoptic Gospels. With Peter's bold statement in front of the apostles, he was confirming that they recognized who Jesus really was. In Matthew 16, he says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Christos means Messiah, which means anointed one. Just maybe the apostles were beginning to get the true picture of the very one who had called them and whom they had been following. And yet, even after the amazing transfiguration at which Peter, James, and John were privileged to have front row seats, the jealousy, pride, and lack of understanding of the word servant was not part of their mindset. They were still trying to figure out their eventual seating arrangements. But now comes the difficult part. They had never really understood how that would impact the entire world, much less, less themselves. Right after Peter's bold recognition, we read that Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and tried to rebuke him. Just maybe they hadn't really learned the whole hard lesson. Maybe that's Jesus, why Jesus had instructed them not to tell anyone. He didn't want them to tell just part of the story. He hadn't died or arose. The gospel that they were about ready to tell was not yet complete. Up until now, Jesus was trying to convince them that he was indeed the Messiah. From here on in, he's beginning to teach him how he was going to suffer and die by the crucifixion of the religious leaders. Each day was going to be a day closer to Jerusalem where the suffering servant was eventually going to pay that horrible but wonderful price. Chapter 10, 32 reads, They were on their way up to Jerusalem, but Jesus leading the way and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he'll rise. Academically, none of this was foreign material to the apostles. The prophet in Isaiah in chapter 53 states, Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten and afflicted. He was oppressed, 
demonstrating that Jesus had fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy. We read in 1 Peter 2, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins. As is so often true with us today, much of this, the apostles, was purely academic. They nodded their heads in agreement. They faithfully stayed with him, except when he went to pray, and then they got sleepy. They followed most of his instructions, like meeting for supper with him one night and going to get his young donkey that they had asked for. When things got a bit out of control during the final week, Peter even cut off the ear of one of the soldiers. They certainly were on his side. But did they really understand his week of suffering? Obviously not. In chapter 9, 32, Jesus said, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But did they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. Three times in Mark, we find Jesus explicitly explaining to his disciples what his last week on earth would involve. And still, they simply missed the whole point. Previously, Jesus had taught everyone who would listen, who, who would listen, crippled, blind, critics, and apostles alike. And then when he did a miracle, he told them not to tell anyone simply because that would not have been the complete gospel. Now things had changed. He was actively facing the cross. He was heading into Jerusalem and all that that entailed. And he did so as a servant, willingly. Without a public defender to bail him out, Mark itemizes in a blunt, no-holds-barred sort of way the events of that Wednesday through Sunday. We see this Prince of Peace standing quietly in front of the, of the loud, mocking crowds. We see this little children's friend listening to mobs who shouted, crucify him. We see this authentic miracle worker unwilling to take himself down from the cross when he could have. We read a sign hanging above this King of Kings, mockingly say, say something about being King of the Jews. Unbelievable, we see a kangaroo court play pseudo-legal games with the eventual judge for eternity. And then finally, we watch the living Lord being wrapped in rags and put in a tomb. What a demonstration of suffering for a messianic king who knew that it was not the Romans he came to overthrow, but Satan. And it was not simply the Jews he came to save, but everyone who would believe that he was the Christ who would suffer and die and then be raised on the third day. But that's not the end. Back in 1984, Pastor Tony Campolo, a Baptist pastor from East Philadelphia, preached one of my favorite sermons. It's Friday. Sunday's coming. In it, he carefully describes what Mark details about the suffering servant, particularly the last week of Jesus' life. Most of Mark's details of Jesus depict suffering and servanthood. It's not until chapter 16 that we get to see the ultimate purpose and goal of our Savior, his suffering and his death for our salvation. And his tomb is empty. He rose. It was Friday, but Sunday came. You may now be dismissed and a little break and get ready to worship this risen one.